Um, so this is uh, all the fault of a student because I uh, did my undergraduate dissertation on Deviant Burial actually uh, back in the day and I've written a, a small paper on it in 2007 in Archaeological Review from Cambridge looking at the emotive force of burial practice but I haven't really touched on this since this topic. Uh, but I, I'm both inspired by the session and by a recent presentation at an, a student conference by one of my own students, Maddie Walsh. I've, I've written a paper up looking at the heritage display of um, early medieval deviant burial practice at Southern Who, and this paper is therefore a spin-off of from that, actually looking back at how we might interpret these practices and these, the postures of these practices in the archaeological record. So it's a bit of a happenstance I come to talk about this topic. And I've, I've done a review of all the literature, apart from the fact that I forgot I wrote a little bit about this in 2006 in my book, and I realised that's a really good point. I totally forgot I made it. But anyway, here we go now, um, and uh, this is going to be some discussion of punitive postures in early medieval deviant burial. And I'm going to focus on the perhaps most famous of sites, already mentioned by Sean in her introduction, the, um, the Anglo-Saxon cemetery, uh, the early medieval princely graves at Sutton Hoo understood through a series of interventions since 1938 and 39 um, and then most famously after other campaigns to re-excavate Mound 1 uh, the, re the excavation of these two this sort of cross-shaped cruciform arrangement in the campaigns led by Martin Carver in the 1980s and the unsurprised the surprising one of the many surprising discoveries of Carver's excavation seasons um, were the discovery of two groups of um, the sand bodies where the, the the impression of the bodies is left behind the bone is almost completely eaten away in most cases impressions through careful excavation of of satellite burials around mound five um, of a range of orientations and a, an unexpected cemetery to the east the transect of excavations went out to the east to see if there was any further um, late sixth early seventh century cremation burials to the east and instead they found a second group and quite clearly from the area of excavation, only part of a second group of um, also these sand bodies. Uh, no artefacts, inhumations in a range of orientations and a range of postures. And these were immediately picked up on by Carver as potentially ritual sacrifices associated with the, 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 le the incipient royal um, elaborate theatrical burial practices of the East Anglian Kingdom and subsequently reframed by the time to the 2005 publication came out, thanks to the work of Andrew Reynolds principally, as another example of a, a recognised phenomenon across southern and eastern England in particular of later Anglo-Saxon execution cemeteries. So just to take you briefly through the evidence, just to whack through this to give you a flavour of the data we have here. So the Eastern Cemetery, the Group 1 of Carver, had 23 burials and 21 graves, but also uh, notably a further five grave-sized features that had no bone in them. So are these somehow dug but never had bodies in them, or were the bodies brought out again? And I'll get back to that point hopefully later on. Clustered around a four-post structure that has been interpreted as a potential gallows um, feature on the site. We've also got three bodies producing radiocarbon dates, suggesting an early medieval um, date for these burials, but no fine-tuned um, um, analysis of the, 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 the chronological range of these burials, but seemingly 7th to 12th century. Some of them are intercutting, as you can see. They seem to be overlapping with each other in places. They, there's a linear slot over, over here, it doesn't pick out very well, along here, that may also be contemporary with these. And one suggestion by Carver is that this is a, a, another gibbet or a row of stakes, perhaps for displaying decapitated heads. Varied alignments, as I've said. Two possible grave markers, very ephemeral features associated with two burials. Only two of these graves have coffins or plank structures, wooden structures, discernible. And um, two graves contain pairs of burials. And the postures vary. Supine, this is what we're interested in really here. Supine, extended, um, some prone, face down, some flexed, and some just called unusual and elaborate postures. Tightly crouched, and the famous running position, burial 27 I showed you in my opening slide, with almost like he's a hurdler, or um, with one leg forward, one leg back, buried possibly with instruments of, their, of, of, of torture. And five decapitant, uh, five with a head identified in a position away from the shoulders, suggesting decapitation that took place. Now the group two burials clustered around the late 6th or early 7th century cremation burial of Mound 5, um, but clearly one of them possibly contemporary, but most of them later, 
um, in cut into the quarry pits. Diverse alignments again, north, south, east, west on various different versions. Um, no coffins in this case. Broadly, radiocarbon dates just 7th to 12th century again, but they could be for all fall within a, a period within that time. We, we, it's not clear. They're all adults, um, as they are in the other cemetery, I forgot to say, and all are male where they could be discerned um, from the osteological analysis, which obviously was a challenge given the poor preservation, but nonetheless, all discernible osteological determinations were, were male individuals bar two possible females in a very distinctive grave, which I'll come on to as well. Four prone, four on the right side, the rest are supine and extended, and they're four decapitations. And grave 49 as a fragment of rope still discernible around the neck of the individual, again implying these are victims of some kind of judicial killing or some, some deliberate killing rather than uh, um, the normal kind of um, 7th to 12th century West East aligned, supine extended Christian burial, although there are variations to that. Um, the, the, this contrasts markedly with, with a standard uh, um, final phase or early, early Christian cemetery practice. So, um, as I said, my recent engagement with this site is re-approaching it and critiquing its heritage display of these finds. And my impression here, and in the forthcoming paper, um, um, Maddie Walsh and myself are going to be writing about how, the, the, despite two of these sand bodies being preserved on site as part of the displays at Southern Hoo, despite the striking now, I think, 18, 19-year-old um, display in the National Trust Exhibition Hall uh, and there's Redwald himself having a look on um, uh, and my son uh, on a recent visit um, that's Paul Mortimer who does a lot of reenactment at the site and um, dresses up in his 7th century gear um, uh, th there's a very much a, a writing out of the story of these burials and frankly <laughs> the, the splendour of Sun Who Mound 1 and of the, ch of the princely burials mean that most of the attention has been taken elsewhere with this site, they're overshadowed and though publications have occasionally mentioned these burials and Carver's own excavation report does figure them and frame them in relation to Andrew Reynolds' work I must say they still the, the sand bodies are still in the shadow of more exceptional discoveries at Sutton Hoo and I think the visitor centre has increasingly written them out of the narrative um, complementing that what I want to do is to actually critique how we understand these burials and I think the variety, the splendid variety of the postures and positions has been kind of written out in the style of academic writing about these cemeteries so I want to have a little bit of a go at Andrew um, not um, because I think his, his study is flawed but because I think by the very nature of his nation, nationwide study um, the, the distinctiveness and the variety at Sutton Hoo has been sort of perhaps uh, not been explored as much as it could have. So Andrew Reynolds' 2009 Oxford University Press book, uh, I'm grossly simplifying the nuanced and interdisciplinary arguments, but there, let's go ahead anyway. <coughs> Social exclusion through public killing can be seen in these burials. This is the political geography um, of burial is key. The location of these sites on prominent um, ridges, on roadways, on waterways. The dead are being fixed in the landscape, not on the margins to be hidden, but to be displayed as part of a, a political geography. He's much less certain about discussing the topographic, the, the internal arrangements of these sites. And he, he, his main point is that the variation of orientation and position of the burials reflects the local topography. It may be a mound they're next to. Um, um, there's orientation varies. He's very much responsive, almost casual. And the burial practice... And this is um, reiterated by um, Lo et al's Oxford Archaeology um, um, monograph on the Weymouth Ridgeway Hill burials as well. Burial practice is shallow graves and casual treatment. And, the, he, and Reynolds concedes this need not reflect, reflect low expenditure of time or labour, um, but it's unceremonious. It's not ritualised, his, his argument. Uh, and the burial methods reflect punishment. So hands, evidence that the posture of the hands has been tied behind the back, as in this individual, not from Sutton Hoo. Um, you can see uh, face down, hands behind the back. This reflects, this is a direct reflection of the torture or punishments um, imposed on that, that body as it goes into the grave. And um, I wasn't going to bring it up, but this does echo with uh, points made earlier today by Nick Thorpe about this kind of, it's about the agency of the of the. the the, 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 the killers over the body of the, of the dead person. There's no room in this argument for the agency of the dead, their stories, their, their, their role in this process, I would, I would suggest. Um, 
And the lack of formulaic practice, Reynolds argues, is, is rules out rit a ritualised dimension. And I understand where he's coming from here, because he's trying to counter the argument that this is somehow to do with pagan cultic practice. And, and I I'm, I'm with him on that completely. But I don't, uh, there's that, still that, his argument is about the lack of formulaic practice equals, um, um, they can't be ritualised, which I, I'm not sure is true. So my point is, I don't think... There's a clear definition in his terms. What does he mean by ceremonious? What does he mean by ritualized? Why can't it be ritualized to do this to the um, people? And the why can't the variability be ritualized? I don't think he's really considered how these burials, the actual event, works as a memory work. Burial is still seen as an event rather than an installation. It's, it's seen as, a, as a, a moment of deposition rather than a process. And so it's almost the counter of the theatrical funerals that Neil Price and Martin Carver have talked about with the elite dead of, of the 6th, 7th century and later Viking Age. But this is somehow casual discard. The body's dumped. And I'm not sure that that is the only way of looking at this evidence. And I think we need to put further attention to the act of burial as installation, but also to think about the material and spatial citations between graves as a means by which these spaces accrued memories and associations of the very kind that Andrew Reynolds and Sarah Semple are arguing for, those places of fear and damnation for the dead. And I think we can look at this evidence again at Sutton Hoo in a more refreshing light with the thinking about the theatre, theatre, theatrical and the drama of execution itself and in placing the memory of violence and multiple violent interludes around particular architectures such as the gallows itself. Uh, this is Kelvin Wilson's um, artist impression of how a gallows may have looked in, in, and, and the, the, the gallows four-post structure um, surrounding a possible tree throw at uh, Sutton Hoo. And... Again, thinking about the drama of the execution and the possible um, the role of mounds, which surprisingly isn't in Carver's report. He doesn't consider, although Kelvin, as an artist, puts a gallows on top of a mound. There's nothing in the report, or even in and and Andrew's synthesis of Sutton Hoo, that suggests that maybe the mound was the platform for the gallows. But that's implicit in the Sarah Semple's art from the 1999 book and also Kelvin Wilson's art from the original Sutton Hoo displays. So it's the performance of the killing but also as an idea I suggested in 2001, actually, that it may be the mnemonics of the mound may have been much more specific here because the individual who was cremated and buried in the late 6th or early 7th century beneath Mound 5 um, seems to have died in a violent uh, in battle or some violent um, event. So is there kind of a direct narrative here between the use of that mound, Mound 5, as opposed to Mound 2, 3, 4, 17, 14, for the, the gallows and the mode in which the individual buried within it may have been killed. So is there a mnemonic going on about the significance of that barrow? There may be other features in the, in, the, in the installation of these burials rather than the event of their deposition that we can think about further. The fact that they're reusing quarry pits around Mound 5, is that simple casual, convenient, there's already a pit there? Or is there a sense of memory through predestination that they're, they're using a mound where there are existing, there's already existing quarry pits, almost like prompting their use as graves? So the, very, the, the late 6th, 7th century creation of a mound through quarry pit extraction creates a space that's almost like waiting for burials to go into. So it's a creation of a, 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 almost a predestined use of the space that may have been important for legitimising and uh, uh, underpinning the, the deposition of the bodies there. And that's an idea that we, we need to think about. Is it just labour saving or is there a relationship with the gallows and with the, existing of, uh, the use of an existing pit that, that, that legitimised or, or helped to imp implant memories of these killings in the body's deposition. But particularly for our consideration here, the slide that Sean's already showed, the artist's impression of the sand bodies, showing the variability of the, the, the postures at work here. There's no two bodies that are the same. And while this picks out some of the more exceptional postures of people with hands tied in front of their legs, between their legs, heads off, down by the feet, um, bottoms on show, you know, I, I wonder whether what we're looking at here is not through a formula, but through the deliberate variation of the deposition practice, reflecting the tortures those people have undergone, perhaps, but also implanting it in time and in memory by the flashbulb of pain, of seeing that body go into the ground that will be fixed there in people's memory as the grave is then covered over. And that may well have been a casual, quick process, but it would certainly have been a process that then installed that memory of that distinctive, distinctive person's demise into that landscape. 
and here's the burial 27 I showed you earlier with this kind of wooden gear that may is interpreted possibly not as it was originally was as a plough but as some kind of rack or element of torture that was used they're still fixed to it as they're buried in the grave and I don't think you needed to do that you don't need to do that um, you could hang someone and then rest them out in a supine position as some of the individuals were you don't need to keep them bound up like that you could make arguments about rigor mortis and they had no way of uh, un un unraveling the body but I think this is, it is, this is about whether it's quick or whether it was slow whether it was displayed for a week or a month or just a few hours this is about in, in installing the dead in a, in a particularly um, graphic and distinctive way and I think some of the intercutting on these sites was unnecessary, given the space and the lack of boundaries around these spaces. So one has to wonder whether is that just happenstance or was there an attempt to refer back to earlier burials in the intercutting of earlier graves? In the multiple burial, the burial, um, the burial here, 42 AD and 43, you have two females and a male buried together. Are, you, are there creations of narratives about the, 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 the crimes that they conducted together, that one can imagine, and the postures in which they're buried that are very specific? Now, we, don't, we can't tell what those stories are. We can start guessing and um, what they might be, what kind of crimes you'd bury two women and a man together in the same pit. Um, but the, the question is, is, I'm trying to ask is, that then installs that in place, that the dialogue of those individuals' biographies are forever together. And the evidence of, of empty grave cuts. Were they digging up bodies after a while and displaying them? Was there um, some pictures taken from the first series of the Vikings, uh, History Channel series, if the, those of you familiar? Oh, and series in two um, as well, one and two. You know, were, were skulls and heads, head states are a demonstrable historical phenomenon um, from place name evidence and from archaeological evidence at other execution cemeteries, were they also displaying body parts above ground as mnemonics to the individual graves buried beneath? So what I'm suggesting is that the variety is about creating a specific memory of in events as installations that then perhaps cited each other as the site accumulated. So these sites didn't have a fixed status as execution cemeteries. This is something that accrued over decades and over, year, over, over, over centuries as famed gruesome executions that would be remembered in the neighbourhood and perhaps region-wide or kingdom-wide were conducted. And this helps us to think, this is artist reconstruction of the Ridgeway mass burial, not an execution burial, but a mass burial, but still on a prominent landscape location near prehistoric monuments and a group of individuals who look like Viking raiders that are sacrificed sometime in the early 11th century. Um, what I think the relationship with the manuscript art that Sarah Semple has talked so vividly about, um, and where we have images of bodies beneath what look like barrows, is that both, rather than, as Sarah argues, the landscape inspiring the, il uh, uh, land the illustrations we find in the 10th, 11th century manuscripts, I wonder whether we're seeing both manuscript illustrations, not only inspired by judicial practice, but both graves and images revealing the link between memory and public killing, that punitive postures were not casual, but staged to be distinctive and memorable and successive as um, the deviant dead were installed in the landscape. And this, I think, is a starting point for thinking beyond execution cemeteries and mass burials and thinking about posture and memory and pain and how the pain of emotions of different kinds from the, the gruesome fears of, and, and dread of perhaps people on looking uh, as well as those, the victims themselves during a public execution to the very other kinds of emotions, the, the variety of emotional intensities we'd expect at a, a standard funeral, or standard funeral, whatever that is, a more typical um, um, funerary practice um, leading to perhaps a churchyard burial or a, a field cemetery burial in the 7th to 11th centuries, that we, we should be thinking about posture, as Sharma was very clearly saying, as not normative, but always relational between the different categories of that any particular society or group are, are, are performing. That these, these burials, these execution cemeteries are always relational in relation to these other cemeteries. But this wasn't simply about contrast. This was about a range, a spectrum of ways in which emotion and memory were being choreographed in the posturing of the dead. Thank you very much. Thank you.